good morning. Wow, I have some presence out there. Maybe it's just up here. Is it out there or up here? It's out there. Okay, good. I maybe turned up a little loud. There you go. The um, uh, big week for us, uh, we start our summer camps, and if you've noticed, boy, there are things hanging everywhere, and if you pull in the parking lot, you think, what is going on? So as Joe said, there'll be uh, between eight and 900 kids here beginning in the morning and another four or 500 workers. People have already asked me, is it too late to volunteer? It's never too late to volunteer. You just have to start at uh, 7.30 uh, tomorrow morning, but there are always some spots to fill in if you wanna come in and help, and it's just a great opportunity. One of the things that we do during the summer is we ask people to come and share about some of their trips and the things that they do, and this really works well with this uh, series because during the summer, you know, you, you, you sort of change schedule and you, you do some things that you didn't do before, and uh, for us, Summer is actually busier than the spring uh, and the fall. We, there's more going on here than there is uh, normally because of all that. And uh, so to kick it off this year, uh, I asked Haley if she would come. I know she's up here, but I asked her if she would come and if she would share with us because she has been going to the uh, Family Legacy um, Conference and the work that's done in Zambia. So halfway across the world. And tell us a little bit about how long you've been doing this. How'd you get into it? I got into it. It was actually Joe McKinney's son, Peter. They went a year before I did. And so when you come back, you have these kids that you've spent all week with and you're trying to get them sponsored so they can go to school and just receive all those benefits. And so Peter came over to my desk and he put down his little booklet of all the 10 boys that he had and just asked if I would look through them, if there was one that I would consider sponsoring, if something was on my heart. And in all honesty, I thought, oh gosh, I'm going to be a bad Christian if I don't. I work at a church. <laughs> <laughs> truly, truly. Hey, guilt, I, guilt works sometimes. It worked. Yeah. It very much did. So I looked through and I did find a boy who stood out to me. So I began sponsoring him. And then that was the first step. And then as far as Joe would meet with Robin and Tia and they would be talking about it and next year's things and all that stuff and just involving the church. And I just felt like I knew it all. Not that I knew it all, but I just felt like I was so familiar with it that like obviously I was going to go. That's where that left me. Like, that is choice. great. And you, the first time you went, you enlisted your mom, huh? Yes. You may be, have been, you may be familiar with the term voluntold. It's, yeah, when someone volunteers you for something. So I didn't actually ask her. I just kind of told her. You're going to Africa with <laughs> that me, you're right? Gonna go. And she was a good sport. She went. It that is great. great. So if you don't know what Family Legacy does in Zambia, it's, it's not just sort of like go help some people or work with camp. It's, it's really a long-term project uh, where, you're, where it's education. So the kids go to school. And, uh, and we, one of the things that we do is people spot, when you say sponsor your, a kid, that's what you're doing. You're paying for them to be able to go to school, to get an education. And then a lot of them end up working back in the camp as they get older. They do, and they're very excited, and they've still got all of the little art projects that they've done in camp, and they're just very excited to be that back. That is great. Like, oh, I was in this group. And the idea behind it when, uh, when it was started a long, a long time ago is you're really raising up a generation that will be the future leaders of that country itself. And uh, so they'll be equipped, they'll be prepared, and they'll have a heart for God. You know, they'll understand uh, who God is, and that will change how they lead and shape their own uh, country. So it's what a wonderful thing to do. Now, one of the things I, I, did, I did warn her about this, so she's had at least a few minutes to think about it. But one of the things that, that I always think is, is interesting is whenever you talk about taking a trip, going doing something like this, there's some fears there, right? You know, it's kind of scary, like going halfway across the world or whether you're you know, just going over to another uh, you know, place in your own state uh, to help with some people. And so there were some, there had to be some natural fears that you struggle with or you thought about and, and you had to overcome those. So tell me about those and how you did that. Well, obviously, it's just a really big leap to go that far away. And I had, I'm had i pretty sure I had never done a mission trip at all. So this was really a doozy of one to start out with, <laughs> which some of that fear was abated in that I told my mom she was coming with me. So I had somebody that I knew that, I, that was going with me because I'm typically the only one from Stonebridge on week two. We just kind of split it up so someone's always around here. 
so I was nervous not knowing anybody, but also then as you come back year after year, people usually sign up the same week so they can see their kids again. And so then all of the Americans get to know each other. Like I know most of the names on the list, even if no one from Stonebridge is going with me this Thursday. The other fear uh, is just something that makes me cringe. It was the financial commitment. And it's, it's an expensive trip and I hate asking for money. It's my least favorite thing in the world. And so I had to, yeah, I had to get over that, the mindset of I'm not asking for the money for me, it's so you can send me, you don't have to give me money, please don't, please don't actually, <laughs> just give it straight to Family Legacy. And so just getting over that, actually, I didn't mention this in the first service, the second year that I went, I wasn't signed up until like February. And I remember thinking, oh, it's just too expensive. And distinctly from the Lord was, uh, oh yeah? He's sassy in my head, sorry. How much did you pay to go last year? I was like, oh, touche. I did not. <laughs> that, that was the hurdle when we got over. That is great. Well, it is, it is a, uh, a wonderful trip, and, uh, and it does involve fundraising um, to be able to do that. And, but you get a chance to impact um, lives and, and really build a legacy there with those families. Yep. Yep. Would you thank Kaylee for coming and sharing with us? It, it really does work well because let me tell you about, let me tell you about this series. We're, we're calling it uh, Summer Mosaic because your life is, is built on a lot of pieces that, you know, down the road you start realizing, you look back and you, and you say, that's why that's there. That's why that's uh, so important. But let me sort of uh, set you up to how we, we, we came to this. I was um, uh, thinking about all the things that you and I are supposed to do or we're called to do. And most of us look at life this way. I'm trying to increase my skills or, you know, things I'm capable of doing because then I get a bigger um, uh, platform or a bigger paycheck or, or bigger notoriety. And that's pretty natural. You know, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that. That's pretty natural for us to do. But one of the things that, that, that happens to us is sometimes you can get a, a bigger place to work or more notoriety and you're really not prepared for it in your character, in what's going on inside of here. And, and because that's one of the things that no one uh, necessarily, you know, pays you for or, or teaches you. In fact, I was reading an article uh, several months ago, um, and it was an interview with a, uh, now, you know, this is what I do with you know, preachers. And it was an interview with a preacher of a large uh, church, really big, uh, as the guy had a lot of influence and become, uh, you know, very um, um, well known and, and had a failure in his life. And so he was no longer uh, doing this. And, and so the guy was interviewing him, trying to go through the things that he'd gone through. And this, is, this was the line that the interviewer put in the article that caught my attention. He said this He said, he, the, the guy he was interviewing, his, his platform had grown larger than his character. I want you to think about that for a minute. His platform had grown larger than his character. Because the idea for most of us is to think, you know, get a bigger, you know, paycheck, a bigger jog, a, a bigger platform. You know, that's, that's just how we, we think. But the problem is if, if your influence or your position gets up to here, but your character is still here, you're going to fail. You're going to have big, big struggles, big difficulties, because this part of who you are, how you would handle it has to match up to, you know, the, the opportunity that you have. But we just don't think of it that way. We just tend to think of the next opportunity and the next thing and the next, you know, promotion or the next, you know, uh, acclaim that we can get. And we don't realize that the other part has to move up and has to match up to it. So this is what I did a little bit different. I started looking at a lot of the stories in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament. And as I looked at those stories, I, I tried to start noticing all the things that God would take uh, men and women through in order not to give them a platform, actually to give, to build their character so that when they got the platform, their character matched it. They were able to handle it. And let me give you an example. There's, there's a guy in the Old Testament and his name is uh, Joseph. And you probably know who Joseph is. So at some point in his life at about 40 years old, Joseph is literally the most powerful man in the known world. He's number two to Pharaoh in Egypt. And Pharaoh has, has entrusted to Joseph all of the authority of Pharaoh 
over Egypt because of things that are coming up. And it's pretty interesting because he actually says this. You should read it. It's really good in, in Genesis, the story of Joseph. He actually says this about Joseph. He says, I need someone who can take my authority, rule over all this, and, and, and be trusted with it. And, he, and his, his Pharaoh, as he looks at all of his people that work for him and that he knows, he says, and none of them can be trusted. <laughs> That's what he says. You, you can't trust any of them. And where am I going to find somebody that can be trusted? And it ends up, he looks to this Hebrew. He wasn't Egyptian, you know. He walked like an Egyptian. He talked like an but he was an Egyptian. And he didn't worship their gods. Uh, he worshiped a foreign god. Um, he had been brought into Egypt as a slave. He had, brothers had sold him into slavery, brought him in, sold him to uh, Potiphar, who was one of the Pharaoh's officials. He'd been thrown in prison because of Potiphar's wife, accused him of attacking her, even though it wasn't true. Um, there in prison, he'd met other men that he'd helped out. They promised to remember him. They didn't remember him. They forgot about him. But God was watching after Joseph's life. And this is what I noticed. Here's Joseph in this position, and he's spoken of as someone who can be trusted, and he could be. He saves Egypt. He saves his own family with his wisdom and doing things that no one else would have done and disciplining him. Uh, he was disciplined enough to do the things necessary. He, he is the man of the hour. How did he get there? And it wasn't about his position. See, we get caught up in how did he get there, meaning how did he get this position? The question is, how did he get there? concerning his character. And he did not get there by winning awards. He didn't get there by, you know, by acquiring skills. He, he acquired them also, but he got there in a different way so that when he's there, he's faithful, he's just, he can be trusted. Even his brothers who say now that he's in this position and he's over us, he's going to get revenge for the fact that we sold him into slavery. Does he get revenge? He does not. What does Joseph do? He what? He forgives his brother. Where in the world does he get that from? How has his character been shaped to get him to this position? So what I started doing, as I started looking at a lot of stories and looking at the Bible and noticing, different than the way you might have story, uh, studied those stories and the things you've looked for, but I started noticing all the things that God took men and women through in order to shape them on the inside so that when they got the position on the outside or the opportunity, um, you know, on the outside, they matched up. They were the person that they needed to be. Because the greatest tragedy, it really is, is when you get a position, but you can't match up. And so there's going to be a failure and it's going to be embarrassing and it's going to be, it's going to be painful because you're not ready for what has been um, given to you. So um, here's how I, I want to kind of take you through this. I know this may look a little strange, but there's a guy um, in, in the uh, book of Genesis that uh, is talked about and, and it really is talking about um, who he was or who he is. And I, so I titled it this, Whatever Happened To. You ever known somebody like that? You, you wonder, whatever happened to? Because, you know, they seem to have a lot of potential. Or this is someone you know, and you say, whatever happened to? And if you look in the Old Testament, there are a lot of whatever happened uh, to's uh, down there. So uh, it, it says, um, here's, go to the passage for me. I'm jumping quickly. This is in Genesis chapter 11. Um, it's a lot of wonderful things in there. But, but look at how this starts in verse 27. It says, now these are the generations of, can you pronounce that name? Anybody think they can pronounce it? Of what? Terah or Terah? Yeah, Terah would probably be the Hebrew pronunciation. Uh, we would say Terah because we're Texans, you know, so, so I'll do it that way, right? So uh, this is kind of the way we pronounce things. This, this is the generations of Terah. So if you want to write something, if you have a pen or pencil, let me tell you what to write down there. This word for generations is, is, is a, a uh, literary style or a way that they would do things back then, especially the Hebrews would. The Egyptians had their own way. Um, Mesopotamia, they had their own way. And this was called a, a tall dot. Now, you can remember that because of the way it sounds, tall dot. It's, especially, it's actually spelled T-O-L-D-O-T, -O -O a tall dot. A tall dot meant that it's, it's the way it's arranged and it's built around somebody. So in this case, it's built around the tall dot 
or the generations or the account of or the history or the life of Terah. And, and, and I know you think, well, the, the generations or the tall dot or the, it really means what became of Terah. That's the translation of it. What became of Terah? What, what are his generations? And they're measured in people. Uh, not actually in, in things, but actually uh, in people. And so then it goes on to say this, the next verse, it says, Terah took Abram, his son, that would be Abraham, uh, and Lot, the son of uh, Haran or Haran. And Haran was, was the uh, youngest son of Terah, and he had, he had passed away. So Lot is, is Abram's nephew, um, his grandson, and Sarah, his daughter-in-law. So Sarah is Abram's, Abraham's Wife and she has no children. She can't have any children. She's barren. And his son Abram, and it says, And they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans uh, to go to the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. So let me see if I can kind of make this work for you by giving you my map. And I always have to make sure to give it uh, backwards. Okay, so, okay. So um, uh, in, in, this, in this map, you would have, uh, they, they're living in Ur of the Chaldees. So the Euphrates River comes down uh, to where Iran and Iraq is now, and that would, that would be where they would live. It would be a Babylonian area in their day. And, and they're going to go back up north to where Turkey is to a city called Haran or Haran. Same as the name of the sun. I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. And uh, so they move from this land to this land, and it is Terra that moves them to this place. And then I'll leave you right there because then Abraham's going to make another journey. So let me explain to you. Most historians will say this, that at some point, Terah and his family probably lived in that area of Turkey. And the reason is because his sons are named after places in that part of the country. So it would make sense that, that they carry those names. But Haran had died. He decides to go back 600 miles from where he is now to this land that he'd, he'd been before, and he takes Abraham with him. Now, here's what we know about their family. They are not worshipers of Yahweh. They are worshipers of multiple gods. In fact, if you look in, uh, in Joshua, near the end of Joshua's book, it actually talks about that, that this is who they were. So Abraham is not raised worshiping one God, but God speaks to him and changes something ab about Abraham, starts to reshape him. So he, they move up into this area, and, um, and here they are. He's taken this area. And let me give you just a couple of, uh, I put a couple of comments in here, so if I don't do them, somebody will ask me to fill in the blanks later, and I don't want to do it. What became of, of uh, Terah? You know what became of Terah? Abraham. That, that's how they would measure his life. And if you want to add to that, Abraham and Isaac. Because once Isaac is born, uh, Terah is what became of him. His generations are completed. That was, that was Terah's life, Abraham and uh, Isaac. So I, I put down some statements here. God gives you an opportunity to invest your life. He's going to do this with Terah. God's going to give Abraham a, an opportunity to invest his life, uh, but you only have a short period of time to do it, right? You got a lifetime and you, and you got to say, I, what am I going to do with my life? Am I going to spend my life? Am I going to, you know, use it for something else? Or am I going to invest my life in, in something that matters? Number two, the biggest investment that you can ever make is with these stories, it's relational. It's always relational. Because that's, that's what your future is. That's, that's the what became of in your life is, is relations. Number three, you have to own it. Now, I'm not talking about the stuff of life. That's where we get mixed up. You have to own the opportunity and say, what will I do with my life and how will I invest my life? And number four, learning um, to uh, own the opportunity is called character development. That's what it means. Something has, has been built in you, you see it different, you live for something different, something has changed uh, in you as far as who you are. Um, Dr. Uh, Tim Kimmel, he, he wrote a book called uh, Why Christian Kids Rebel, and I just stuck a quote in there because I thought it's a really good book, you should read it, but I thought this quote was really good and it fit, because this is what he said. He said, fortunately for me, my parents were more focused on what was going on, say this with me, going on what? Inside of me than they were on what was going on outside of me. You see, that, that's the future. That's the investment. That's what character actually is all about. 
is understanding and knowing that that's the most important thing. It's not the platform. It's not what you own or what you attain. It's the person that you become and, and whether or not you have become the person who can take that platform or that place and use it in a, in, a, in a good way, in a way that honors God himself and would be a representation of uh, God himself. Here's what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, some pretty famous verses. He says, uh, do not worry then saying what we will eat, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we uh, wear for clothing. It, it's not that these things are not important. Jesus is not saying they're not important. This is a part of life. He's just saying they're not most important. He says, so don't worry about those things. He says, for the Gentiles, and that means those who do not know God, uh, the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, um, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things. But catch this, seek first, most importantly, is what he's talking about. Seek first what? God's kingdom, God's righteousness. That means the character that God has, how he wants us to do things, and then he says of these other things, what? They'll all be added to you. In other words, those things will come. The question for you and the question for me is, yeah, but what will I become? How will God shape me? And will I learn the lessons? Will I go through the things that God wants me to go through so that when I get to that place, I have become the person that God wants me to become so that I can utilize that and take that on in a way that's faithful to God, faithful to those around me, and that God can uh, use me well in those things. Number five, God wants to build character uh, so that you will invest your life in what matters most. Uh, you will invest your life in a lot of things, but you certainly don't want to miss the things that are most important. And then number six, and here I'm going to jump back into Abraham's story. God gives Abra Abraham wonderful, wonderful uh, hopes and dreams to build his life upon. Wonderful hopes and dreams. And see, God is the one that can give hopes and dreams that go beyond who we are, go beyond our life. They, they point toward a future for our life. So here's where it picks up in chapter uh, number, number uh, 12, the next chapter about Abraham. It says, the Lord said to Abram, catch this, leave your native country, your relatives and your father's family and go to the land I will show you. So he's not even telling him where it's going to be. He's just saying, you go, I will show you. You be faithful to follow me. Verse 2, he says, I will make you a great nation. That's one of his promises. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. It's another one of his promises. He says, and I will make you famous. In other words, he literally says, and I will make your name great. I'll make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And then he says, um, uh, and, and you will become then a blessing to others. In verse 3, he says, I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who treat you with contempt. I will curse those who curse you. And all the families of the earth will be blessed by you. Now, let me summarize it because I know there's a lot done usually on this and the promises uh, given to Abraham. But here's what I want you to catch and focus in on. Here's what God, two things that he's saying to Abraham. Get out. Get out of the old way. Get out of the, the way your family, what they worshiped, the gods that your family worshiped. Leave. Leave uh, your father, Terah. You're, you're going toward, he's going to go toward Canaan now, a whole different place in life. I want you to leave all that behind and go after something totally different. And then I will make a difference in your life. In fact, here's the second thing. This is, he literally says, be a blessing. I know it's not translated that way here. But that's the literal translation that he says to Abraham, be a blessing. Get out and be a blessing. Go do something different. Now, God is the one who provides for Abraham the things that he needs to be a blessing. But it is a challenge to Abraham. Get up, get out, go be a blessing to other people. Go be a blessing to other families. And, and through Jesus, Abraham's descendant, God does bless all the families um, of the earth. It's, it's the promise that he made uh, to him. Here's number seven. Then he has to grow Abraham's character in order to match up to the promises, the hopes, the dreams 
that he, and the challenges that he's put in or called Abraham to. So let me, let me read for you the, the next part. This is verse number four. It says, so Abram departed as the Lord has in, had instructed, and Lot went with him, because remember, Lot's his nephew, because Abraham's brother um, has passed away. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. He took his wife, Sarah, his nephew, Lot, and all of his wealth. And look at how he's already uh, blessing other people, Abraham is. His livestock and all his people that he had taken into his household at Haran and headed to, for the land of Canaan. So already he is taking other people with him and their lives are going to be changed by Abraham as he goes down toward Canaan. Now, here's the problem. Uh, it, it can be discouraging sometime. It could be discouraging for Abraham because as he goes down toward Canaan, what we're going to read is Canaan is in famine. Why would I go there, God? Why wouldn't we stay here? Well, it really had to do with Abraham's character, with what he was making Abraham into by leaving his family, by leaving the worship practices and who they were before and going in a different direction. He was going to reshape Abraham's life. And here's the interesting thing about it. Abraham almost blows the whole thing. He almost blows the whole thing. If God was not watching after him, if God had not been faithful, he probably would have. Because Abraham just doesn't catch it or get it right away. And there's so many things that he's got to learn and so much that God is going to have to teach him. And Abraham is going to make a lot of mistakes. He's going to fail a lot. But through that process, God is reshaping Abraham's life. I think that's important. And I think that hopefully that would be encouraging to you because most of us just don't like failure, right? We're, we're afraid that we, that we might fail. It might not work out. Listen, there are a lot of things to fear in life, but, but fearing the becoming and the, and the transformation is a mistake because God wants to reshape your life and he wants to reshape my life just as he wants to do this with Abraham. So look at the next passage in verse number 10. It says, at that time, a severe uh, famine struck the land of Canaan, forcing Abram to go down to Egypt, where he lived as a, say that with me, he lived as a what? Man, I don't even live here, God. This is not my land. I'm down in Egypt. I thought we were headed toward, toward uh, Canaan. Verse 11 says, and as he was approaching the border of Egypt, Abram said to his wife, Sarah, here's where he almost blows it. Look, you are a very beautiful woman. Sarah's 65 years old at this time. Just to let you know. And she was still striking, as you'll see in the story. Verse 12, it says, When the Egyptians see you, they will say, This is his wife. Let's kill him. Then we can have her. So please tell them you are my what? Yeah, just lie to them. Say, oh, no, no, I'm his, I'm his sister. I'm not his, I'm not his wife. And uh, they didn't have any kids anyway, right? Uh, then they will spare my life. This is Abraham. Then they will spare my life and treat me well because of their interest in you. Sound pretty human? <laughs> sure. It's exactly what it is. And then in verse 14, it says, And sure enough, when Abram arrived in Egypt, everyone spoke of Sarah's beauty. When the palace officials saw her, they sang her praises to Pharaoh, their king. And Sarah was taken into the palace. Then Pharaoh gave Abraham, it worked. Pharaoh gets blessed from it. He gave Abraham many gifts because of her, sheep and goats and cattle and male and female donkeys, male and female servants and camels. So, so he gets rich all off of Sarah's beauty. Verse 17 says, but the Lord sent terrible plagues upon Pharaoh and his household because of Sarah Abraham's wife. And apparently, uh, Pharaoh, and they figure out why. They understand that these bad things have happened for a reason. And it says in verse 18, so Sarah, uh, Pharaoh summoned Abram and accused him sharply. What have you done to me? He demanded. Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister and allow me to take her as my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her Get out of here. You know where he told him before, go be a blessing? Now Pharaoh kicks him out as a blessing, right? I want you to go. <laughs> Get out of here. 
Pharaoh ordered some of his men to escort them and sent Abram out of the country along with his wife and all of his possessions. Now, I think this is so important because I want you to catch Abraham almost blows the whole deal. And you say, well, I understand. Why would you say that? Because the, Abram, is, as far as the legacy of Terah, it's going to be Abraham, and it's going to be who? It's going to be Isaac, his son. Isaac will be the child born uh, to a couple who could have no children. He is the child of promise. He is the legacy of Terah's life and will be of Abraham's life also. Without Sarah... There can be no Isaac. And Abraham gives her away in order to benefit, to take care of himself. Would it take care of Abraham? No, it would blow the whole deal. It, 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 he would lose every promise that God had made to him if he loses Sarah. And Abraham, unfortunately, is not smart enough to figure that part out. But God is. Now, let me tell you why I think this is important for me and for you. You can't figure it out either. I can't figure it out either. But what we can do is learn to trust God, that God will be faithful. And even when I don't understand it, I don't understand how it would work out this way. It doesn't change the fact that God does. He sees what you don't see, what I don't see. And so many of the things that God is going to take you through, you're going to say, I don't understand why am I going through this? Why is this happening? God, why won't you fix this? Why won't you change that? That's natural for us to do it. And if God were to do what we ask so many times, it would blow the whole deal. We, we would prevent God from doing what God wants to do in our life, from building in our lives, the character that God wants to build in our life. I, you know, I say that um, Abraham will do this again. <laughs> this is not the only time he did this with Sarah. He did, it, uh, he did it again. He fell back into the same trap. And Abraham continues to struggle and to, ch and to have to go through changes. Embarrasses himself many times, but God remains faithful to Abraham. And God works out his promises through Abraham's life. And Abraham, sure enough, he gets out. He walks away. He changes. And Abraham becomes a blessing, not only to the people around him, but he becomes a blessing to us. It probably happened 3,500, 4,000 years ago. You still know Abraham's name. Most of you still know Sarah's name, Isaac's name, because God had a plan and God had a legacy that he was going to leave for us through them. I say this because what is God doing in your life today to build your character? It's probably not what you think. It probably is not, it does not involve the next award or the next skill learned. Instead, God is taking you through lessons in your life that you don't understand, but that God is saying, you need to learn to trust me, to believe me, and let me take you through these things. I told you a couple of weeks ago, if you were here, I got a new chihuahua. His name is Teddy Bruski. Anybody hear when I was talking about Teddy? Two and a half pounds of terror. I mean, he is. I think he's part squirrel. And uh, he's, he's, he's kind of an amazing little guy that, that uh, my wife and I got. Just to let you know, my wife did find out. She did some more research and found out that he was not only living on the street, but there was someone who had ownership of him, and he, he was abused and, uh, and a lady saw it and actually came up and somehow coerced the person whose dog this was to let this little puppy go and to let her take the puppy. And that's how we ended up with him. But he's gone through a lot of rough things in life, right? A lot of fears in life that he has, that he's going to be mistreated. Uh, just yesterday, he got out of the gate, the front gate with me. Joni's not there. My wife's not there. So it's my responsibility. And of course, he got loose. And he goes flying out of the front gate because my neighbor has, has walked out of the, his front door and I didn't know it. And thank goodness, um, he's older than I am. And so he's wearing flannel pajamas. Even That's right. Even today. And he's wearing a, a long flannel robe as he comes walking out. And my little uh, chihuahua, Teddy, 
can, you know, he knows, you know, they know when someone's out. He takes off barking and lunging at, at my neighbor. Well, my neighbor's used to that we have chihuahuas and they bark, but he's used to that he reaches down and they're very friendly. So he reaches down. I'm flying out of the gate also going, no, where are you going? And I see him and I see my neighbor reach down and I go, no, do not, do not expose flesh. Because he, he will chomp down. I mean, that's what he's going to do. And all that clothing, you know, he, he probably can't get, get through. So I'm like, no. And I catch him in the air as he's lunging. I really did. I caught him in the air because he's little. And I grab him and go, this is our new dog. You know, and he's showing those teeth and going, you know, he, he wants a piece of my neighbor. And uh, within a few seconds, he calms down with me holding them there. And he said, oh, okay. And I tell him the story, which is why he will bite you. And uh, because he's afraid and, and he was uh, abused and this is just how he has learned to live life. And then at some point I'm talking, I bump heads with him like that on purpose with little Teddy. And he goes, oh, that's probably not a good thing. I said, it is with me. <laughs> I can bump heads with him. Why? Why can I bump heads with him? He trusts me. He knows, he knows I care for him. He knows that I love him. It's a different relationship. And as time goes on, as we continue, Johnny and I continue to love him and take care of him. Listen, he, he changes. He's, he's better and better. Now, if you come over to the house, he'll bite you. Just let you know. <laughs> he doesn't trust you yet. He doesn't know you yet. He'll, he will bite you. But hopefully, in, in, in time goes you know, on, he trusts us enough to know that we're not going to put him in that situation. I'll just to let you know. Uh, three days ago uh, in the morning, he bit me. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm just, uh, he's just sitting in my lap. I'm petting him on the head, and all of a sudden, and, he, and it wasn't playful bite. He bit me. Then he realized, uh, probably not a good idea. But, uh, you know, so he still has these moments, right, that it pops out, but he's learning. And his learning is based on that very thing, that he knows he can trust me. Listen, God is the same way with you and I. You, you may not understand. Maybe there's some fear in your life. Maybe you just feel like, you know, I, I, you know I, I've been hurt before. I've gone through pain before. And maybe you're not sure that God can be trusted. But he can. God knows what is coming. You don't. God knows what is ahead for you. You don't. God knows the, the places and the platforms that he has, he has dreamed of and he's thought of for you and for your life. You don't. And so God is shaping your character and he'll take you through things that you don't understand why he's taking you through those things so that he can build into you the character that he needs and that you need for those things that God will call you to. We're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. It really is about reshaping us, overcoming the fears that we naturally have. And Jesus gives his life so that we could trust him. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you. You know us. You understand us. You have plans for us, plans that we could not know, we could not understand. You just tell us that you have them. You tell us that you're moving us toward a future that is unseen for us. And that the secret to that future is our trust in you knowing that you don't let us down. You're always faithful. Even through some of the most difficult times in life, the most trying times in life, that those who came before us, they faced also, but that you were faithful to those things, you will be faithful to those same things to shape us, to build a character in us that you want, that matches up to the places that you want to take us. If you're here this morning, you've never put your hope and your trust in God himself. The good news is he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to prove that he did love us. And Jesus didn't come to hurt us. Jesus came to heal us, to change who we are, how we see life, all because of our trust in him as we pray in his name.